Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel. From the greatest climbers in history to some of the youngest in the world, we cover it all. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. Before the 2015 earthquake that would shake Mount Everest to its core, there was one of the darkest days of the mountain's history in 2014, when a large chunk of ice broke away from the west shoulder and was a catalyst to the mother of all avalanches. In the early morning on Friday, April 18th, an entire climbing season would be disrupted as history would be rewritten on the most dangerous area of the tallest peak of the world, and those most affected are the ones all climbers rely on to reach the roof of the world, Sherpas. This is their story. Making the week-long trip to Mount Everest's base camp is no easy feat for the average person, as it is a constant seven to eight hours of trekking per day along with elevation change. But once climbers do reach camp, on the south side, there is only one thing that everyone sees and it has brought fear into the hearts of even the most experienced climbers, the Kumbu Icefall. To summit the mountain on the popular South Call route, you have to traverse the icefall that sits just 400 feet above base camp. This is important, as many climbers make their way through the glacier several times as they acclimate their bodies to the altitude before making a serious bid to the summit. Acclimatization is when a climber would climb to a certain point on the mountain, spend a period of time there, usually at one of the various camps, then descend back to base camp to rest. They would repeat this process, each time reaching a higher point before they are ready to make a summit push. But why is a glacier that isn't even near the death zone of 8,000 meters the most feared part of the climb? Well, the Kumbu Icefall is made up of small and large crevasses that have to be traversed by walking across a ladder along with large chunks of ice called seracs that can break away at any point, wiping out anyone unfortunate enough to be below them. But the most dangerous part of the icefall is that the glacier is always moving. In fact, it moves roughly three to four feet per day, causing the route through the ice to constantly change. In a normal climbing season, many of the Sherpas would wake up early to evaluate, lay new guidelines and ropes through the established route as needed. I cannot stress this enough, anyone summiting the mountain from the South Call route relies on these Sherpas every day, as they take on the bulk of the risk spending the most time in the icefall. There is a reason that statistically, this is the deadliest part of the mountain for Sherpas. Those that do have to pass through the Kumbu Icefall try to do so as quickly as possible, as speed is the name of the game when traversing an always shifting piece of ice, especially when the average climber will pass through the icefall six to eight times during their time on the mountain, while a Sherpa can pass through the icefall up to 40 times during a climbing season. I don't think there is any other stat that shows the discrepancy and risk Sherpas take on more than this one. In 2012, two years before the incident, some experts such as Hymex Mountaineer Russell Bryce began noticing some ominous signs from the icefall. The route through the glacier typically leans towards the left side of the icefall, as this was the path originally established by Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary nearly over 60 years ago. The left side of the icefall just happened to be under some of the largest seracs on the entire mountain, some over a thousand feet long, but it was the smaller pieces pointing to the unstableness of the ice, as climbers would watch during the day as chunks of them broke away and tumbled over the route. During the busiest points of the season, there would be 50 plus climbers during peak hours trying to traverse just under the ominous wall of ice, something Bryce was not comfortable with, and controversially, he would call off all expeditions to the mountain. This mainly upset his clients, who paid thousands of dollars for Bryce and his company to guide them up the world's tallest peak, but Bryce just couldn't bring himself to stomach the danger. 2014 started off no differently than any other climbing season. With hundreds of climbers receiving permits, it was set to be a busy year on the mountain, and there were high hopes around base camp leading up to the season, as the weather so far had been good. On Friday, April 18th, 
close to 100 climbers would begin preparing to set out on the Kumbu Icefall. There was no established route that morning as a ladder had fallen out of place on a steep section of the climb, causing a bottleneck of climbers. This video, recorded that morning at 6.04 a.m., shows a team of Sherpas climbing an interconnected ladder, trying to continue setting the route through the icefall, along with Kaji Sherpa explaining that this was his fifth time on the route, but he was feeling good that day even with the difficulties. This was merely minutes before all of their lives would change. Mark Horrell, an experienced mountaineer and author, was one of these climbers preparing with his team to enter the icefall, but they were lucky. As they made their way towards the ice, Mark and his team watched the disaster unfold right before them. At 6.45 a.m., a large chunk of ice, estimated to be 113 feet thick and weighing 31 and a half million pounds, broke off from Everest's west shoulder, triggering the mother of all avalanches. The sound of ice and wind was like thunder, drowning out any noise, and quickly the entire icefall was covered by snow. Although it is reported as an avalanche, it was mostly ice chunks falling throughout the glacier similar to a rockfall. 25 people were engulfed by the snow and ice, all of them Sherpas. Many were killed instantly, not because they were buried, but because shards of ice exploded around them, almost like a grenade blast, piercing their bodies with shrapnel. For those not killed, many were injured or buried by the snow, but there were a lucky few that were still near the entrance of the glacier and would walk away. This became Everest's deadliest tragedy at the time. Almost as soon as it happened, the noise and falling ice stopped. Then there was sound of life, people scrambling through base camp, climbers shouting over the radios, teams screaming at each other, preparing what gear they had. It was chaos but it was intentional chaos. Some climbers would pack up their gear and leave immediately, noticeably shaken. The experienced climbers, Sherpas, and those that were already acclimated to the mountain began making their way to the Kumbu Icefall, but all Mark and his team could do was watch. Those that began the walk, which was only roughly five to eight climbers, would enter into the icefall carrying ladders to reinforce the route while others carried spades. Three hours after the accident, the rescue helicopters finally began to arrive and crowds, including Mark, would gather around the helicopter pads. Each climber that was found in the icefall would be carried by a litter or stretcher that dangled below the helicopter. It was an ominous sign for those waiting at base camp, as each time the helicopter approached, they did not know if they were carrying a body or someone who needed help, but there always was a dangling basket in the air. But unfortunately that day, most of the trips resulted in recoveries. In total, there were nine Sherpas injured, three of which were critical, but all nine would survive. Thirteen of those trips would result in a body being brought back to base camp, one of those being Kaji Sherpa, who was just on camera merely 30 minutes prior to losing his life. After 48 hours, the conditions had worsened, and the rescue team was worried about another Serac potentially falling, so the rescue efforts would be called off, even though there were still three missing Sherpas, but they would never be found, and even to this day, their bodies still lie somewhere buried in the Kumbu Icefall. A total of 16 Sherpas would lose their lives, with nine others suffering from injuries. It did not take long for critics to step forward, and there would be many controversies following the accident, mainly surrounding the Nepalese government, as they only offered 400 US dollars to all 16 families, which the Nepal Mountaineering Association dismissed out of disgust, as they felt it was a disrespectful offer for the risk that all the men took on. But it did start a dialogue in the mountaineering community, and even those not in the space began to take notice of the risk that Sherpas took. It became obvious rather quickly who the unsung heroes were. Most of the Sherpas would go on strike that season after being frustrated by the Nepalese government, essentially ending all climbs up the mountain unless certain demands were met. First, they wanted to be recognized for the poor conditions they were faced to deal with, and that steps would be taken to not only increase their resources, but also their protection and life insurance. The community also wanted the Nepalese government to pay 10,000 US dollars to all the families that lost their loved ones. For many of these families, their husbands, 
fathers and sons were the sole providers for them, and losing a family not only devastated them emotionally, but financially. And while the $10,000 could not end their suffering, it could at least provide them some comfort. These demands also affected those climbers that had paid upwards of $50,000 to be on the mountain, and with no expeditions, they essentially would lose out on their money. While most of the climbers understood and felt sympathy for the Sherpa demands, they were still frustrated with the Nepalese government. Nepal finally agreed to pay the families the $10,000, and then another $5,100, bringing the total financial benefit for the surviving 16 families to $15,100 US dollars. Additionally, the following season in 2015, the route through the Kumbu Ice Fall would be changed to focus more on traversing through the center, away from the large hanging seracs that may fall at any point. While it is not a foolproof fix, it is a certainly a step in the right direction, but the terror of the glacier will never go away for those that take on the roof of the world. twenty twenty two was a deadly year for Denali. The tallest peak in North America is actually not the most feared mountain in the Northwest Hemisphere. That award goes to Mount Rainier in Washington, but Denali had multiple deaths on the peak in twenty twenty two. For perspective, since nineteen thirty two, Denali is responsible for hundred and twenty nine lives being lost, while Mount Rainier has claimed over four hundred, according to Outsider magazine. But the six thousand one hundred and ninety meter or twenty thousand three hundred and ten foot mountain mountain is not to be taken lightly, as the location of the peak presents even thinner air, unpredictable weather, and extreme temperatures. All dangers three climbers would soon learn themselves. This is their story. Denali lies in central Alaska, roughly 300 miles south of the Arctic Circle and 200 miles east of the Bering Sea. The peak offers some of the largest vertical gain on any mountain on Earth, with base camp at 7,200 feet and the summit at 20,310 feet. This 13,110 feet of gain over 12 miles is larger than Everest's 10,525 feet, but Denali's most terrifying danger is the weather. It is known for brutal winds and snowfall, especially as you increase in altitude. There are some very technical reasons and research around why the peak suffers from some of the most challenging weather in the world, but essentially, due to its latitude so far away from the equator, the polar jet streams and polar front put it in a prime location for absolutely brutal storms that can envelop the peak in hours. There are typically very few summit days on the mountain, and no season better reflects this than 2023. In May of 2023, prime climbing season, a seasoned Denali and Alaska range guide described his weeks on the mountain as being in the apocalypse of wind and snow for days, with good weather windows of less than 24 hours barely opening to allow us to move. 2022 was not exactly like 2023 though. There were some good weather days and 700 45 climbers would summit the peak, but it came with a price. Matthias Rimmel was a 35-year-old professional mountain guide from Tyrol, Austria, and had made his way to Denali National Park in the early part of the year. He wanted to summit the peak in early May, before the climbing season was fully underway. Matthias was an extremely experienced climber, as he had spent years of his life dedicated to the sport. He also came from a family of mountaineers, as when he became an official guide in 2015, he continued a legacy lasting four generations. A close friend of Matthias would still our parents were mountaineers. We grew up that way and we loved to do it. We just loved to be in the mountains. Our heart goes out in the mountains. Matthias's goal was to climb all seven summits. This means he wanted to climb the tallest peak on each of the seven continents. Less than 750 people in our entire history have completed the feat, and Matthias would be climbing alone, alpine style the purest form of mountaineering. This means he would climb with little gear so that he could travel up and down the mountain quickly. The entire trip should have taken five days, but Matthias was preparing supplies for ten, just in case 
A normal expedition on the peak is typically 17 to 21 days, so Matthias was attempting to climb the peak in a fourth of that time. Denali's climbing season is typically May through mid-July, so when Matthias set out on the peak on April 27th, well, to most climbers it was too early to be climbing, but this was intentional, as Matthias would have the entire mountain to himself. There was nobody to fix ropes or help him if he ran into trouble at any point on the slopes. He would be climbing the most common route up the mountain, the West Buttress, which isn't known to be a technically difficult route, but there are areas that are particularly dangerous, especially higher on the mountain. There are many ridges and slopes with intense elevation gains, meaning one wrong step could send you tumbling thousands of feet to your death. By the time Matthias set out from base camp, he had already acclimated to the altitude over the previous weeks on nearby mountains. His goal would be to reach 14,000 feet, where he would set up camp on a flat plateau just below the Messner Kular. For many climbers, this would typically be Camp 3 and the last camp, where there is toilets, rangers, and medical supplies, all luxuries Matthias would not have. From 14,000 feet, most climbers would push to 17,000 feet to rest at Camp 4 before making a final bid to the summit. But experienced climbers can actually summit the peak from 14,000 feet in one day. This is the primary reason why Matthias was climbing so early in the season. When the mountain is crowded, long lines will form at Camp 4 in the early hours in the morning. This makes it difficult for the more experienced climbers coming from Camp 3 to reach the summit, as their expedition can be delayed several hours due to those lines. Some mountaineers who experienced this delay claimed it took them over 24 hours to climb from Camp 3 to the summit and back down. For perspective, if there were no delays, it should take climbers 14 hours total to complete the trip. This is why Matthias decided to climb the peak alone. He would reach 14,000 feet with relative ease and set up camp before resting and pushing further up the peak. On Saturday, April 30th, while traversing the Autobahn, a steep slope at 18,000 feet, Matthias began to feel the effects of his climb. He would contact a friend and let him know that he was tired, but he was not in distress. In fact, he was confident in his climb. Matthias had been checking in frequently with progress updates over the last two days, and the expectation was that he would continue to notify his partner of where he was on the peak. The following day, May 1st, was the expected summit day for Matthias, but there was no call that would come from the mountain. Initially, this didn't raise major concerns, just some anxiety, but after Monday would pass with no communication, reality began to set in for those waiting. On Tuesday, May 3rd, Matthias was expected to reach base camp, concluding his expedition, but instead, his partner would be notifying local rangers and guides that Matthias had missed his check-ins and he feared for the worst. Since the season was in its infancy, along with no other climbers on the mountain, a rescue operation would take time, and it wasn't as simple as just beginning to climb the peak. There simply wasn't the personnel ready to climb the mountain, as no acclimatization trips had begun. But if they wanted to save Matthias, they had to be quick. But as you recall, they all knew the climber had only brought enough supplies for 10 days, and they were all ready on day five. Not to mention, this was if he had not taken a dangerous fall or was stuck in harsh weather conditions. Time was against them. Eventually, a helicopter would reach the peak Wednesday afternoon, and they would start the search with Matthias' camp at 14,000 feet. They were able to quickly identify his tent amongst the white snow, but clouds would begin to roll in, making it difficult to see the peak. The pilot would find no sign of the climber. The weather would continue to be harsh on Thursday, further delaying any opportunity to fly over 17,000 1,200 feet, meaning if Matthias was still alive, he would have to survive day 7 alone. On Friday, May 6th, the helicopter would take off for the final time. The weather had finally eased, making it easy to spot any color amongst the dark rocks and white snow. After flying to 17,000 feet, the rescue team would spot a jacket just below Denali Pass. Denali Pass at 18,200 feet is notoriously a treacherous stretch of the West Buttress route, and it didn't take long for the crew to confirm that it was Matthias laying in the fall zone. The consensus is that he likely slipped on the steep slope and fell to his death 
over a thousand feet below. That exact location is responsible for 13 deaths as climbers have slipped and tumbled down the peak. The weather on the mountain had been particularly cold and before Matthias' summit attempt, there had been five inches of snowfall in the upper region of the peak, making for horrible conditions. Matthias would be the first death of 2022, but two other climbers would also lose their lives. An unnamed Japanese climber would fall into a crevasse on a glacier connected to Denali while unroped from his teammates. He was crossing an ice bridge at 8,000 feet when the bridge collapsed. There was no hope to save him. 48-year-old Fernando Berman of Stockton, New Jersey would also lose his life on the upper slopes of the peak. As part of a 12-man team, he would collapse at 19,700 feet. His exact cause of death would not be released, but his partners would all state that it had all the symptoms of a sudden cardiac arrest. Matthias's body would eventually be brought down the peak later in the season after rangers had acclimated to the weather. I think it is best to end this tragedy on the words of Matthias himself. With over 700,000 meters of altitude in winter, 200,000 meters of altitude in summer, with well over 90,000 kilometers by car and 130 overnight stays in mountain huts or bivouacs per year, I am constantly on the move with my guests in the mountain world. There is one route on Everest that only a few men have ever dared to take even to this day. On a mountain that is known more so for its traffic jams, I was a little surprised when I read that sentence. But while we are familiar with the South Call and even more difficult North Call route, there is another path to the top of the world that we have never covered before on this channel. And for good reason, as 98% of Everest expeditions are on those two routes. But for those brave enough, or maybe crazy enough, there is the West Ridge Direct. There have only been three expeditions that have successfully summited the West Ridge, and it has not been conquered in over 30 years. In 1974, a French expedition was trying to become the first men to ever conquer the deadly face. But a mountain like Everest doesn't give up without a fight. This is their story. Before we jump in, I do have to get this out the way. Yes, there was a team that some may argue summited the West Ridge in 1963. In fact, it was two Americans, Tom Hornbean and Willie Unsold. But they are not credited with the full summit, as during a particular difficult part of the climb, they switched to the Hornbean Coulor route, which is technically not a part of the West Ridge Direct. What makes the West Ridge so difficult and dangerous is exactly what led the two Americans to abandon the route in 1963 and an expert expedition in 1971 to consider the route insane. The higher you climb, the more technical and difficult the route becomes, as there is a windy, thin path that has sheer drops to either side, with barely enough room to even set up a tent. The entire path is littered with rocks and boulders that only become more difficult the higher in altitude you are, and if you are able to scale the difficult terrain, there are several avalanche chutes that feed directly over the route. That is why nobody even tries it today, and honestly, I'm impressed after looking at some of the pictures of the route that anyone even dared to climb it. We all know how difficult climbing even a simple route while in the death zone can be, much less scaling vertical boulders covered in ice and snow. In the death zone or above 8,000 meters, the oxygen in the air is about a third of what it is at normal sea level. So being able to pull your body weight up the rope, well, it just doesn't seem possible to me. But the 1970s were a different time. While today we focus more on safety and innovation, during the early years of mountaineering, many expeditions took on more difficult and riskier routes with the intent of being the first to accomplish a feat, bringing pride to their country. Oh, and of course, being recorded in the history books. After all, there was only one first. Before we get back to 1974, we have to talk about one of Everest's biggest factors when scaling the mountain, the weather. And while I have covered countless stories that talk about the dangers of bad weather on some of the tallest peaks in the world, there is still a period of the year that we have not covered, monsoon season. Yes, you heard that right. Since Everest lies in between Nepal and Tibet, between the months of June to September, the mountain is under the control of the Indian Ocean monsoons. During this period, warm and wet wind from the ocean blows to the south slope of Mount Everest, which causes frequent and violent snowstorms. The weather is also slightly warmer in these months, but can change quickly due to the rapid storms. That is why most Everest summits take place in April and May, just before monsoon season. 
Most days during these months, there is a mist that settles on the peak, making it difficult for those below to monitor and even see anyone's progress on the mountain. That is why even today, June through September is considered off-season for trekking to the mountain, as even those that want to get a glimpse of the tallest point of Earth cannot. The specific details of the expedition are hard to find, so I will do my best to fill in the gap, but in 1974, Gerard de Vassou got approval to lead a French expedition up the west ridge of Everest. They would be climbing from base camp and making a direct ascent to La Ho Pass, which in itself is difficult. This would let them skip the Kumbu Icefall, which we know from my other videos is one of the most dangerous areas of the mountain. But if there was a way to skip the dreaded icefall, why would more climbers not elect the route? Well, it is an ascent through steep rocks and ice for 9,200 feet over a distance of three and a half miles. You would have to climb through small avalanche chutes with staggering vertical walls all around you. It is not for the faint of heart, and the expedition leader had decided to take on the West Ridge at what they thought was the end of monsoon season with the help of over 20 plus hoarders and Sherpas. During the entire trek to base camp, the weather was miserable, essentially raining the entire time, and the further in altitude they trekked, the colder it became. Because of the rain, there was a strong mist that would settle around the mountain, but the expedition did eventually reach base camp on August 25th. Gerard's expedition was composed of a number of Chamonix guides who are known for their mountaineering ability, as Chamonix is the home of Mont Blanc. Although even today it is still considered as one of the mountain capitals of the world, Mont Blanc, standing at 4,810 meters, is significantly different from the 8,000ers that lie in the Himalayas. While I cannot judge, I do believe that this could have played a factor in what was to come over the next few weeks. They would almost immediately begin the climb to the west shoulder above La Jolla as the weather had finally cleared for the group and they wanted to take advantage of the clear skies. They would make it through the pass, setting up Camp 1 at 19,000 feet on the flank of the shoulder in late August. But almost as soon as camp was established, the weather would once again begin to snow on August 29th. This is important for obvious reasons, but also because the snow would be constantly covering the rocks and shaping the terrain, making it more difficult to climb the thin path. It may not come as a surprise to those listening, but Gerard would encourage his team to continue climbing, as he believed the weather would eventually lift and provide them an opportunity, so they continued to push and eventually established Camp 2 on the flank of the shoulder at 21,000 feet on September 4th. The entire expedition would then continue climbing for the next four days, where they would establish Camp 3 at 22,650 feet on September 8th. Gerard and six Sherpas would return to Camp 2 to resupply, but Camp 3 would be established on the crest of the ridge, and while it was higher up on the mountain, it was actually significantly safer because Camp 1 and 2 were exposed to two avalanche chutes that had always intimidated other expeditions, and at 7.30pm on September 9th, Camp 3 would be the best place to be. The night of the 9th, an avalanche would be triggered because of the significant buildup of snow higher up on the mountain due to the constant storm. This is common during monsoon season and is the exact reason why Everest becomes significantly more dangerous during the four months. The avalanche would flow down the chute of the West Ridge and completely obliterate Camp 1 and 2. When I say obliterate, I quite literally mean that. There was nearly nothing left. No bodies, no tents, or supplies. Nothing. Unfortunately, Gerard and five of the six Sherpas that were with him would all be killed, and they would never be seen again. To this day, their bodies still remain somewhere buried on the mountain. There was only one surviving Sherpa of the avalanche. After the tragedy, the remaining climbers would abandon the attempt and rather quickly get off the mountain, as they were afraid of another avalanche occurring because, of course, the snow had not stopped. The West Ridge would eventually be conquered by a Yugoslavian expedition in 1979 and would be nicknamed the Yugoslavian Route. They spent over two years planning the route and learning from the French expedition before them. The entire team was 49 individuals, all of them selected for their specific ability, and it would take nearly 50 days before they conquered the mountain. The story within itself is incredible. I encourage anyone who is fascinated like me to research it. At the time, it was considered the greatest achievement of any Yugoslav sports. To this day, there have been less than 30 expeditions up the West Ridge Direct, and only three have ever conquered the route. It is safe to say that it is the most difficult and demanding climb to the roof of the world. And while I do believe it will be conquered again one day, 
will have to be by those willing to give up everything. There are few legacies like that of Mikhail Gargani. Stories claim he could hang on a rock ledge with only a single finger for over a week, never making a sound. He is considered the greatest alpinist of his time, depending on who you ask, of course. It is impossible to deny his impact on the mountaineering world. I mean, he has his own statue, a song dedicated to his memory, and even a planet named after him. The Queen of England, Elizabeth II, would watch the Georgian in action at a competition in Wales and be so impressed that he was dubbed the name Tiger of the Rocks. Climbing was in Mikhail's DNA. He was born to be an alpinist until one fateful day on July 4th, 1969. He was climbing Su Alto Dolomites in Italy when a sudden rockfall struck him directly in the chest. This is his story. Mikhail stood at the base of Mount Ushba closely analyzing their route and replaying every technical move in his head. He aimed to be careful but successful as his team was counting on him. I mean they picked him for a reason. He was the best of the best and nobody compared to his skills. He stood with confidence as they waited for him to start. He took a deep breath, nodded to his companions, put his foot on the rock, and started to climb. Mount Ushba was certainly not the tallest in elevation. Its south peak stands at 4,710 meters or 15,453 feet and the north peak at 4,690 meters. But it is considered the most difficult summit in the Caucasus range. It consists of steep granite, ice, and mixed terrain. Loose snow builds on the mountain's features, making the route prone to avalanches. Detailed information on the peak is limited as it is very remote, only accessible by foot, and the stories that are known are filled with accidents or in most cases, fatalities. The Sfan, or people native to the mountainous region of Savanti, associate Ushba with mystic legends that refer to the mountain as a dangerous place. Mikhail had a deep respect for the mountains and understood the risks that he was taking. The team made good progress as they climbed the North Peak's eastern wall, a 1,300 meter high traverse that is accessed by first climbing the Caladia Glacier. They would rest right under a section named the Mirror, which to this point had never been climbed before. The vertical section of the rock is the most remote and hardest traverse of their climb, but must be completed if they were to reach the summit. Mikhail looked upwards, carefully analyzing and preparing how he would tackle the overhanging section. His comrades were completely depending on him to set and establish the route. Snow had made the rock damp, and from below he could not spot many holds, but it would not be long before Mikhail set off, his only protection a poor belay down below with his team. Within a few minutes, he was at the overhang. He reached up and began to pull himself further and further until he realized there was no hold left for him to continue. Maybe for the first time, Mikhail felt nervous. The retreat was impossible given his position, and he began to understand the gravity of his actions. He shouted down to his friends to untie his rope, but they certainly would not abandon their leader. No. Instead, Mikhail closed his eyes and began hearing Georgian folk songs being loudly chanted in the wind. He felt invigorated, completely inspired as he was focused and began to slowly climb upwards, inch by inch, rock by rock, until eventually it was done. He had reached the top. Michaela was born in 1932 in a small town of Mestia, Georgia. He was a climber from the moment he took his first steps. His grandfather was Anton Kajani, who participated in climbing rescues, and his father, Vesorian Kajani, was a well-known alpinist. Michaela's father understood the risk of mountaineering and would try to prevent his son from the sport, but would soon be forced to accept his passion. From childhood, he was distinguished by his composure, self-esteem, and hard work, all characteristics of mountaineers. He was deeply convinced that all glory and success can only be achieved through hard work. At age 14 in 1946, Mikhail would secretly follow a mass ascent in Svanti that his father was a part of. He hid behind bushes, watching the men from afar, until the sun was setting and base camp had been established. Mikhail approached the men that night convinced that his father would have to accept him, as it was too far to turn back alone. With the support of the other men, eventually his father would agree, and the 14-year-old made his first ascent. From this accomplishment, he would receive a USSR climbing badge, and this would just be the start 
of a legendary career. In 1951, he would go on to attend and graduate from the Soviet School of Mountaineering Instructors. It was here that he received his legal name, Mikhail, as the Russian professors were unable to pronounce his birth name. The name Mikhail would be written on his passport and never changed. But it was also at this school where his skills began to be noticed, and he started to be more involved with the community. In 1952, Mikhail shared the title of USSR Climbing Champion in Yalta with Sheliko Majani. In 1956, he was named the champion of the USSR for the first ascent of the northern face of the Tayataibashi. In 1957, he placed third place at the USSR Championship for the first ascent of the northwestern face of Dongus Orhan. In 1958, he became friends with John Hunt, the leader of the 1953 Everest expedition, who quickly noticed Mikhail's skill and ferocity when climbing. His impact began to spread into Western Europe, and in 1960, he traveled to England, where he received the nickname Tiger of the Rocks from Queen Elizabeth II. In 1963, Mikhail would be named Honorary Master of Sports for the USSR. In 1964, he was named Champion of the USSR again for his climb of Ushba. In 1965, the world recognized him as one of the best mountain climbers in history. He would then go on to be named Champion of the USSR yet again and win a gold medal. In 1966, he would receive the Badge of Honor for Outstanding Sporting Achievements. Finally, in 1967, Mikhail was named the International Master of Sports and an honored coach of the Georgian SSR. From 1960 to 1967, he never lost a climbing championship and received numerous international awards. Every autumn after the climbing season ended, Mikhail would return home by hiking through the pass of Savante to his father's house. As soon as he walked inside, he placed all his medals for the year on the table looked at his dad and said, this is for you. You made me like this. This is all yours. He was beloved by the former Soviet Union and without a doubt, the most popular sportsman during his time. His reach would expand globally as magazines and newspapers publish reports of his climbs with catchy headlines. Mikhail was not a man of many possessions and coming from a small country had some trouble being integrated into society. However, his fame and skills earned him a spot as an honorary representative of the USSR, a well-deserved title and the world recognized him for having an amazing spirit. When asked what Mikhail's favorite thing to do was, he would go on to state, no matter how many medals I have, I much prefer to have saved many mountain climbers because it makes me happiest to save a person's life. In the summer of 1969, Mikhail, along with a group of Soviet climbers, set out for the Italian Alps, making a series of difficult and spectacular climbs. For the most part, their trip was highly successful, well, until they reached the final peak, the 2,951 meter high Mount Sualto. The mountain is part of the Civetta group located in the eastern Dolomites and is one of the most impressive natural sights to behold. Civetta is considered one of the greatest alpine climbs and it is nicknamed the Wall of Walls, more commonly known as the world famous Northwest Wall. Almost all summits in this range require difficult and technical climbs, as the vertical expanse is well known for its dangerous rockfalls. Sualto is a part of the Southwest Great Ridge, nicknamed the Magnificent Triad. After many successful summer summits already, Mikhail started his day on Sualto with great enthusiasm and in excellent spirits. The beginning did not prove to be too difficult, as this was his second time climbing Sualto, following the Gabriel Levanos route. He flew up the mountain with his known veracity and was nearing the top in no time. Towards the end of the climb, all he had left was to traverse a vertical section. For the final stretch, Mikhail was partnered with alpinist Vyacheslav Anishenko, who was given a belay from below on a ledge. A bin blocked Vyacheslav's view of Mikhail, which is not uncommon or unsafe in certain conditions, so he was not able to visibly observe what happened next. He heard a loud roar, the familiar sound of falling rocks. Vyacheslav prepared himself, expecting the inevitable pull of the rope but it never came. Instead, the rope jerked, then went slack, and he heard a scream. The Georgian climber Mikhail fell 600 feet to his death. An unexpected rock struck Mikhail straight in the chest when he was about to finish his climb. He fell, but on his way down, a sharp rock severed the rope and would prove to be his ultimate demise. The accident 
devastated the mountaineering community. Poetry and folk songs were created in his honor, spreading information about the 37-year-old claiming God had given him special gifts of discovering the innermost secrets to the mountains. Some say he could predict the weather, but in reality, he was an ordinary person, a person with his own daily worries and joys that cannot live without his mountains. Michaela would later be buried in his home village of Mestia, where a museum now stands dedicated to him. In 1971, the Karjani Rock Climbing Prize was established in the Soviet Union in his honor. Several peaks and routes have been named after him. For all climbers, both young and experienced, he was the standard of not only high skill, but also a person who was always ready to come to the aid of those in need, always ready to share everything he had. In 2017, the Matthews family received a photo of a frozen body of a young man on Everest. They thought the body could be their son Michael Matthews, one of the youngest British climbers to ever take on the tallest mountain in the world. Michael's journey was anything but straightforward or easy. His very survival would be tested until he would achieve his goal and suddenly disappear. But what would happen after his disappearance is unlike any story that I have covered to this day. This is his story. This entire story actually begins with a magazine, an article about climbing Mount Everest in a men's lifestyle magazine in the late 1990s. Jamie Everett dropped this article off on Michael Matthews' desk while at work and simply told him they should climb Everest. It didn't take long for Michael to look at his friend and co-worker before saying, yeah, why not? Michael Matthews was not an ordinary person with an ordinary background. His father, David Matthews, was a self-made millionaire and had instilled intense drive and dedication to his children in everything that they do. This was represented more so in Michael, maybe more so than any other of David's children. You know those people in your life that are just naturally good at everything, without even really trying? Well. That was Michael. By his early 20s, he was a young, good-looking guy who was very fit and had already started out on a successful career as a trader in London. This is when his friend and co-worker would bring up Everest because of a magazine article, and Michael would never look back. He had some experience climbing small peaks, but he had never taken on a challenge such as Everest. Obviously, he knew the tallest peak in the world was dangerous, but if Michael was successful at summiting the peak in 1999, he would become the youngest Briton to climb the mountain at the time. The challenge and history books, this is what drove him. 8,848.86 meters, or 29,031 feet. That is the height of the tallest mountain in the world. There were obviously many dangers on the peak, and this is only magnified for inexperienced climbers. Just check out my other videos, and you will see this represented in so many cases. But there are two areas on Everest that are particularly dangerous on the West Buttress Route, and both are important to today's video. The first being an area just above base camp, the Kumbu Icefall. It is known as the Sherpa Killer, as the ice is constantly moving. The second is the balcony, which is located in an area above 8,000 meters. Imagine being utterly exhausted. You can hardly breathe because the oxygen is a third of what it is at sea level. Each step feels like you have cinder blocks chained to your feet, yet you must still traverse up rocks and small ridges. All the while, the summit seems so close, as if you could reach out and grab it, but it just never gets any closer. It is a mental battle above all else. This is why Everest is one of the hardest mountains in the world to climb. When David heard about his son's ambition to climb Everest, his first thought was that Mike could not do this alone. David would decide to join Mike and Jamie and would ensure that his son had the best support that he could buy. David would eventually settle on OTT expeditions and shell out $40,000 for one place on their 1999 expedition team. To prepare for the climb, the trio would train on mountains such as Aconcagua, but this is where David discovered that due to a surgery he had on his carotid artery, it prevented him from climbing at altitude. He was forced to drop out, but the successful businessman would interview each of OTT's guides to ensure they were suitable for his son. In April of 1999, Mike would fly to Nepal and begin the eight-day trek to Everest's base camp. Mike made it look easy and oftentimes would be hours ahead of the other climbers waiting in the next village for them. During this time, Mike would quickly develop a friendship with another member of the team, Dave Rodney. Dave would take several videos and pictures of Mike during the expedition, along with being one of the last few people to see him alive. 
After reaching base camp, the expedition team would set out on their first real tests, the infamous Kumbu Icefall. It is considered the most dangerous part of the mountain, for good reason, as there have been close to 50 deaths within the icefall. But Mike made the giant crevasses look easy as he traversed confidently over the ladders set up by the Sherpas, as if certain death did not lay just below him. The groups would continue acclimatization trips up to Camp 2 and 3 before resting. Acclimatization trips are important for climbers because it allows their bodies to become adjusted to the higher altitudes, so that when they do attempt a final summit push, their chances of success are significantly increased. But it was during one of these trips that the first complications of the expedition began. Jamie, Mike's co-worker and friend, began developing cerebral edema, which is the swelling of the brain increasing the pressure in his body due to a lack of oxygen at the higher altitudes. His legs stopped working first, and then he was unable to sit up. They had no choice. They would place Jamie in a game off bag, which encases your body like a coffin, with the only view being a tiny clear window. You pump the game off bag with oxygen to simulate a lower altitude, and they are typically only used in life-threatening scenarios. Jamie would be stuck in the bag for five to six hours. When he got out, he thought to himself, if I stay here, I will die. And that was the end of the expedition for him. Mike would reach Camp 4 on May 11th, and almost instantly they would go to their tent to lie down and rest. Camp 4 on Everest lies on the tip of the South Col, just under 8,000 meters. Famous mountaineer Nims Persia describes it as a place for survival mode. Everyone is worried about their life. They don't really care about anything. That is why they call this area the death zone, because life simply cannot sustain itself at this altitude, even with supplementary oxygen. The expedition would rest in the morning of May 12th, but there was a concern brewing around the amount of regulators and bottled oxygen they had. The climbers were supposed to be provided with Russian oxygen systems, but while they did have the Russian systems, it was partnered with UK and US bottles, which didn't fit the systems. What a day this has been. Boy, did I ever suck wind. If it wasn't for my good friend, Mike Matthews, with a little pep talk, I don't know if I would have made it, buddy. <laughs> Are you feeling, pal? I'm feeling just fine. Oh, yeah? It's like golf because of the dry air, but I'm sure Dave Soup will uh, <laughs> make everything all right. The final summit push would begin the night of May 12th at 10 p.m. Dave would be climbing with his guide, Dennis, while Michael climbed with his guide, Mike Smith. Dave and Dennis were a little quicker on the upper slopes and would soon press ahead of Mike as they all made their way towards the balcony. Dave would eventually summit Everest and look down at the clouds below him, claiming it was unlike anything you had ever seen before. During his descent, he would come across Mike at the base of the Hillary Step. Still on his ascent, they would lock eyes and Michael would shout out, Did you make it, buddy? with Dave responding, exclaiming, I sure did, and now it's your turn. After Dave made it down to the south summit, he turned around to get one more glimpse of Michael, who now stood at the top of the Hillary Step, and coincidentally had turned around at the same time. They each gave a thumbs up, then a wave, not realizing that wave was goodbye. Michael would eventually reach the summit with Mike Smith on May 13th, 1999, becoming the youngest Brit to reach the pinnacle of Everest at the time. But during his descent, a storm would begin to roll in, bringing intense snowfall and fierce winds. What happened next is still controversial to this day. Michael's guide, Mike, was walking ahead of the pair on the descent. He claims it was to clear fixed ropes that were being buried by drifting snow, while others speculate their own theories. Somewhere between Camp 4 and the southern southern summit near the balcony, Mike turned around and saw nothing. Michael was gone. The snow made it impossible for Mike to climb back up the peak, and he waited at the balcony at a height of 8,500 meters for over an hour. Mike would state, I was getting plastered with snow, and I tried to get back up the hill, but it wasn't feasible. I had to make a decision. Do I stay there and wait for who knows how long, and fall asleep and never wake up, or go down? Mike would descend the peak, losing a toe to frostbite due to his time spent in the death zone. So it's uh, 5.15 on May 14th. It should be probably one of the happiest times of my life. Lying here, thinking about Mike. He was tired too.
Typically, when a mountaineering accident occurs, the events are reviewed to ensure that there was no foul play, particularly in certain circumstances with foreigners. So when the British Mountain Guides Professional Standards Committee began their review of Michael's death, the Matthews family were convinced they would find something, but it didn't take long before all the guides in the expedition were cleared, much to the dismay of the Matthews. This would not deter them though, as the Matthews family would launch a lawsuit against the three guides and OTT expeditions. Their primary argument was that the oxygen provided was not up to the standards for the climb, and they were actually right. Sort of. It came out two months after Michael's death that every single client on the mountain had claimed the oxygen sets were not up to the standards promised by OTT, but every professional western guide would say the exact opposite. David Matthews also believed that Mike Smith had abandoned Michael due to the intense storm in an attempt to save himself. OTT's defense was that plenty of clients reached the summit with their system, and even stated, my business is tested and proven. People who use my service take huge risks. I can't afford to let them down. Although there was a problem with the new system, which linked a Russian demand valve with British tanks, he adapted the set satisfactory. Eventually, the Matthews family would lose the case and no legal action would take place. But this wasn't the end of the story. In 2017, 18 years after Michael's disappearance, a photo would make its way to the Matthews family. A photo that looked like it could potentially match the outfit and location of where Michael went missing. Spencer Matthews, Michael's younger brother, would launch a full-blown rescue team, hiring some of the most famous mountaineers in the world to search the upper regions of Everest for his brother's body. The entire project was filmed, and there was a documentary called Finding Michael that dives into Spencer's story and body recovery mission in full detail. Spencer unfortunately would find out that the picture was not Michael, and his attempt to search the peak would end with no results of his brother, but he was able to return the body of a Sherpa to a family in Nepal, something Spencer claimed Michael would have preferred over his own rescue, as he had a deep respect for those men. Michael Matthews still lies on the world's tallest peak to this day, most likely covered by snow, somewhere on the upper slopes of the mountain. But nobody can take away the history that young man accomplished, or the legacy that lives on within his family.